Hey there kids, just as a reminder, I'm a narrator on Chilling, the awesome horror app that features over a thousand horror stories, over a dozen narrators, some of whom you may already know from YouTube, as well as full-length novels, exclusive series, and chilling originals. You can select and change the ambient sound in the background of stories whenever you want without affecting the story you're listening to, and we release hours and hours of new stories every week. Click the link in the description down below to start a free trial and see if you like it. Also, Chilling's always doing fantastic giveaways, and if you check over at thechillingapp.com and you've already started your free trial, all you have to do is leave an honest review and enter to win one of the giveaways on their website. Chilling 2.0 is also on its way, which I don't want to spoil any surprises, but it's well worth your time if you've already signed up. That's it for now. If you guys want to check out more of Chilling, please go to the description down below, head over to thechillingapp.com, or you can just find Chilling on the App Store on either iPhone or Android. And now, on to tonight's story. My family doesn't eat meat after 6 p.m. I always thought this was normal. Other families followed this seemingly basic principle. It wasn't until I moved out that I learned how weird of a thing this actually was. Other families didn't adhere to what I had always thought to be a fundamental dietary guideline. Only my family believed in, well, the consequence. For nearly two decades, I refrained from eating meat after the clock struck six. Regardless of how much of a craving I happened to have for it, even if there was plenty left and I hadn't finished my plate, I was expected to either scrape the remains into the trash, so much food waste, or to put it in a Tupperware for the next day. I always tried to get home soon enough to eat dinner before then, but with school and extracurricular activities, that wasn't always possible. I remember when I just finished hosting a session for an after-school club, and I was on my way home, starving, and I hadn't eaten all day, when I got a text from my father saying that he had bundled all the meat up, and to not expect any left out. He'd sent the text at 5.47pm. I arrived home feeling disappointed, but quickly got over it, as it was simply something that had to be done. It was, well, for us, normal. The fear of the consequence guided our lives. Because of how integral it all was to my family, I'd never once brought up the topic with friends, much like how you probably wouldn't bring up the fact that you put your dishes in the sink or the dishwasher. It was never conversationally relevant to bring up our no meat after six rule. To me, it was mundane, unremarkable. It might sound like this was an odd, though ultimately harmless, restriction, a familial eccentricity, which many families have in one way or another. And in one way, you're right. I wasn't abused, I slipped up once, and while it was treated gravely, given a stern, thorough, not frighteningly heated warning, there was no traumatic punishment, physical or otherwise. There was some leniency in the exaction of the consequence with regards to children, but the consequence itself was so utterly bizarre, so needlessly grim, that its very existence made the whole thing unforgivable. I would have rather been raised vegan lived a life bereft of meat for some allegedly noble cause than the one that I had, because that knowledge, that ever-lurking fear, messed me up in other ways. I don't have PTSD, neither do I have some psychological block preventing me from eating meat after 6pm, thank god, but I do have knowledge of the consequence, and I'd do anything to forget it. When I shared that knowledge with my girlfriend and how I still adhere to it, something she had consciously noticed, she left me. And not only did she leave me, she called me a lunatic. Me, who had never once said anything certifiably crazy. Me, who would treated her with care, respect, and kindness, with an unembellished record of staunch sanity. All because of the fucking consequence. She left yesterday, and in doing so, took all of her things from my apartment, which included most of the cookware, since she'd brought hers over in the absence of my own. I'd relied on the microwave and an air fryer prior to her moving in, back to such lowly states. Bought a hot pocket after an unusually exhausting day at work, that olden dinner upon which many have relied throughout the ages. Cheeseburger flavor. 
Additionally, I bought a bag of those low-fat air-fried chicken tenders to supplement the traditional nutritional meal. I was physically tired and emotionally wrecked. I guess in the grief of my heartbreak, I had thought it worthwhile to share the events with my cousin during the drive home, with whom I'd always felt a close, brotherly connection. He apparently felt it necessary to tell my parents after the call ended, who took it upon themselves to come visit me. While sitting at my small dinner table, eating my hot pocket and tendies, there came a few knocks at my door. I got up, I answered, and bewildered, I let my parents in. My mom hugged me, my dad gave me a knowing and solemn pat on the shoulder, and told me in many words that I'd be fine, that I'd find someone better. Absent-mindedly, I brought them into the kitchen and offered them some tenders, since I cooked the whole bag. I hadn't paid attention to the time, ironically. I hadn't even paid one thought to that thing that ended my relationship. My mom's face was the first to change. It went from sympathetic, despondent, to confused and then horrified. My dad's reaction was a little belated, as if he couldn't quite fathom the events. His expression of fatherly contrition slowly melted into a snarl, a visage of mounting contempt. Finally, glancing over at the microwave clock, I realized what I'd done. Speechless, my mother merely stood at the threshold of the kitchen. My father, equally voiceless, gently pushed past her and headed towards the front door. I heard the lock click, and then he returned, his face grimly set, resolute. Stunned, I sat there at the table, the cheap meat churning in my gut. My plate and the half-eaten hot pocket and chicken tender crumbs suddenly seemed like a profane thing. I wanted to sweep it off the table. After guiding my mother to a seat, my father went and leaned against the kitchen counter. His hands clasped together. He looked like a pastor in prayer, his posture almost reverent. A terrible, baleful silence fell upon the kitchen, like the sudden hush of an audience before a public execution. Oh, oh, my son. My baby. My mother's shaky voice almost broke me. I met her eyes, and she averted them. But she couldn't bear to look at me, her own son. I tried to apologize, but my mouth was suddenly dry. The room suddenly felt hot, stifling. I couldn't seem to breathe, let alone form the words. Slowly things started to feel wrong. Anxiety reared itself like a massive wave. My vision swam. Objects became blurred, indistant, amorphous. My own parents became like phantoms, shifting, immaterial. I gripped the table for balance, for stability, as if I were the one losing corporeality. It's happening to my son. Oh my god. I'd never heard my father sound so defeated. His voice almost brought me back, almost reversed the nauseating unreality of my sudden affliction. In my mounting delirium, my mother's whimpering sounded almost musical. Sing-song, like a lullaby she'd whisper sing to me as a child. When I felt my face begin to slide free from my skull, I screamed. But it was altered, distorted as my lips came loose, as my tongue followed in their wake, as if taking on the burden. My mother let out a scream of her own. To me, the world was now no more than a kaleidoscope maelstrom of images, one of which was my maniacally shrieking mother. The rest of my body fell apart in turn. Bits crumbled away, layers slewed off, fluids leaked and oozed. When there was finally just my skeleton held together by strips of stubborn sinew, my father began cleaning up the mess. My mother's mind was pretty much gone. She'd screamed herself senseless, unable to move, lacking the connective tissue to do so. I just sat and I watched as my remains were collected and deposited into a bucket he'd gotten from beneath my sink. The stuff, the meat, was then slowly poured into the sink. The grinding and gurgling of the garbage disposal as it worked to break up my flesh somehow calmed me. It would have soothed my nerves if I had still had them. When the deed was done, he lifted my bony hand and placed it gently on the table, then did the same with the other. 
I could only watch. My eyes hadn't withered away. He, he then shuffled around the kitchen, and not finding what he was looking for, went searching throughout the apartment. I, I couldn't guide him. Not that I would have. I knew what he was searching for, and the last thing I wanted was for him to find it. But he found it. Eventually. He set the toolbox on the kitchen table as if it were the most delicate thing in the world. It was old. It had been his, but it was sturdy. And the tools inside hadn't been used once since he'd gifted them to me. With both hands, as if there was precious jewels inside, he raised the lid and removed the hammer and a few nails. He raised the hammer and then lowered it and helped my mother out of her chair. He led her to my couch and returned, his expression pained but set. He was ready. No matter how much it would hurt him and me. A nail was placed atop my left hand. The hammer struck once. Twice. A second nail was placed on my right hand and was embedded to its head with three solid table-shaking strikes. It was somehow pain. All that was left of me was bones, somehow flimsy pieces of dead flesh, and somehow I felt it. More than just a vibration, I actually felt the puncturing of the bone, the fracturing of my hand, some phantom skin sensations. Affixed to the table in a seated crucifixion, I was a prisoner. I knew that I had every right to be, given what I'd done. What I'd do if I were free, and yet I was terrified. I was appalled. By my father's eyes, by what I had become, by what he'd done to me without so much as a few calming words. The stink of my discarded ground flesh lingered, wafting up from the garbage disposal, the viscera still clinging to the pipes. I wanted to cry, I wanted to scream, but I could only stare and suffer. And then the urge came insidious and powerful, like a switch had been flipped in my brain, the newly emergent psyche demanding that I perform the unthinkable. It galvanized me, made my bones pulse and quiver. They rattled in place, and I heard my mother moan in fright. My father sat across from me, watching me with hammer in hand, an eye torn between mind, one terrified, the other unthinking, save for that deplorable impulse. Stared back. That abysmal silence returned. When my skull began to grow back, the urge increased by magnitudes. I nearly lost myself completely to the abominable impulse. My parents left around the time that my face finished reconstructing itself. It felt new, so I'm sure it looked incredibly uncanny. Probably more unnerving than the skeleton had been that they'd stared at nearly an hour. I thought I'd die when the skin formed around my hands, when those new nerves, excited to sense and feel, were unfairly bombarded by the sudden, unexpressibly excruciating sensation of those long nails in my hands. I felt my mind fold into myself. I withdrew into an unthinking fugue. Even after I'd finished regenerating, I sat there for twenty, thirty minutes dreading to rip out the nails to bring even greater agony upon myself, but... but I had to. And I did. Thank God I didn't have the voice for the pain that my vocal cords hadn't yet grown taut enough to handle the sonic burden. I would have brought the whole complex running to my door with my screams. I know that had my father not done that, I would have done far worse to someone else as something worse than a ghoul, as some kind of fleshless reverent. I would have gone on a monstrous prowl. I would have seized and devoured someone. Long ago, centuries before my birth, some far distant ancestor committed atrocities against a few fellow townspeople in some long forgotten village. Either one of extreme desperation I want of dire circumstances. A simple, sadistic gluttony. I never found out why. I just know that he committed terrible... Terrible crimes. 
cannibalized people. The people related to those he hurt were so devastated, subsequently filled with wrath that they employed all manner of curses and addictions, dooming him and his kin forever and ever to unforeseeable and unpreventable malignancies and restrictions. Consequences related to the consumption of meat. Not long after, an entire generation was rendered gastrointestinally incompatible with meat. Others down the line had been able to eat and eat and not get full, no matter the quantity or content. I don't think I could have lived with the polyphagic plague not for long. In my family, our consequence... For whatever reason, we can't eat meat after 6 p.m. unless we shed our flesh. We transform into hyper-ravenous fiends, skeletal nightmares who prey on friend, foe, or family in a frenzy of insatiable hunger. Unless we're detained, starved for a period of time, dependent upon factors seemingly beyond our control. For some, it's hours, others, days but the body eventually regenerates. And our humanity afterwards is, for the most part, restored. I'd never succumbed to that despicable, horrific state before. It was the most awful thing that had ever happened to me. But now, no matter the circumstances, I'll never forget the consequence. It's not something I can afford to overlook. Jeffrey, thank you for being such a dear and watching Rex while I'm away. I've included a simple list of instructions for you to make this easier. I hope he doesn't give you too much trouble. Rex likes to sleep in the guest room on normal days, and typically won't come out until around lunchtime. It's best to not bother him until then anyway. You'll find his food dish and water dish above the stove in the pantry. Give him one scoop of wet food, found in the fridge, and one scoop of dry, above the washing machine. Water bowl should be cleaned after every use and only use sink water with the Brita filter, please. Rex prefers the dark. Please don't turn on any lights in the house while you stay here. Sometimes he gets a little feisty in his old age. It's best to ignore him when that happens. If there's bad weather, please lock him in the laundry as he gets very anxious. If he needs to exercise or go for a walk, remember to go at night so he isn't bothered by noise or neighbors. The leash and collar are under the sink. He loves to watch the TV show Dexter and Fuller House. Money for yourself is on the table, and keep the house keys on your person at all times. See you on Thursday. Thanks, Miss Lofton. Side jobs are always odd ones, aren't they? I got the gig from a co-worker right before the Christmas break when I said I needed some extra cash, you know, something quick to buy some last-minute gifts. They had known the Loftons for years, and ever since her husband passed away, my co-worker told me that she takes a trip this time of year to avoid feeling sad. But that dog is her best friend, so naturally, she wants the best care while she's gone. After putting in a good word for me, I was contacted with the instructions I transcribed above via the email. A second secure message told me where the house was located. It wasn't a big house, but typical for the neighborhood. The big, fenced-in yard with a Beware of Dog sign attached made me almost reconsider. My co-worker said when he did this job last year, he'd never even seen the dog at all. So, why did I feel like I was being watched as I crossed the yard to the wraparound porch? The house keys were in the mailbox, just like the secure message told me. I could hear the TV playing as I unlatched the door. I could see immediately Mrs. Lofton wasn't kidding when she said that she kept her house dark. All the windows were curtained and the blinds drawn. It was hard to see really much of anything in the front room foyer except the desk where she kept her mail piled up. Closing the door back, I used my smartphone to light the way into the den, listening for Rex to come tearing through the house at the sound of an intruder. It felt very weird to me to sit in a dark den in a stranger's house and be completely alone. Guess this is what I signed up for, I muttered to myself, as I saw the dog's dish not far from the entrance of the den. 
It was already empty, which I guess meant that he had already eaten whatever she gave him before she left on a trip. I decided to go ahead and fill it up with the prescribed food, walking down the hall to the laundry. Big mistake, really. When I passed by the guest room, I saw the silhouette of the dog laying there on the floor, and I paused uncomfortably. I mean, I'm a dog person. I have two dogs at home, so... Why did this old husky make me feel uneasy? I couldn't put my finger on it. But decided to try and be friendly anyway. Hey there, boy. I'm Jeff, I told him. The dog did not respond. I whistled to try and elicit a response, but still got nothing, so I just kept on walking to the laundry. As I reached for the dry food, I heard the low guttural noise from behind, Rex just making himself known. I told myself as I got the scoop and then walked back to the den, Making you some supper. Want it now? I muttered. This time, I didn't pause to look at the dog. When I finished mixing the two types of food together, I shifted the bowl around to make noise and try to get Rex to come eat, but no dice. Guess you really do want to stick to your schedule, I said, as I checked my phone. Something told me these five days were either going to be long and boring, or filled with unease. I didn't like either option, really. I settled down in her wingback recliner, and I got on my phone. Of course, the internet was shitty. I shouldn't have expected anything different, but I just scrolled through my Instagram feed and Snapchats, trying to pass the time until Rex made himself known. Every now and then, I would glance up at the hallway, which led to the guest room, hoping to see the husky romp out tiredly, only half glancing because, well, it was dark. For a second, I thought I heard something, and I waved my phone flashlight towards the hall. For that split moment, I thought I saw Rex standing up on his hind legs. Shit. I fumbled with my phone and tried to get a better look. Nothing was there. I decided that freaky moment was the time to confront this dog. Maybe if I spent a little time with Rex, he wouldn't seem so scary to me. Walking to the next room, I used my phone's flashlight again and got a good look at Rex. There was... nothing super special about the hound. He looked like he was half asleep blind in one eye and snoring and shaking a little on the side of the bed. Actually, it looked like he was chewing on something. I realized this as I took a closer step. The dog made a low growl, wanting me to stay back, but curiosity got the better of me and I took the chance. It was a big rat, half rotted away and stuck between the hound's teeth and its paws. The thing looked like it had fought against Rex valiantly, but ultimately lost. I took a step back into the hallway and tried not to panic. Was a dog able to eat a rat? I googled it and paced the kitchen, praying the internet would hurry up and give me an answer before the old dog wound up choking on his tiny bones. It is instinctive for cats and dogs to pursue small prey, such as rodents and birds. In some cases, pets simply pursue and kill the prey. In other cases, the prey animal is consumed by pets. Can't tell you how relieved I was to read that answer. I didn't like the idea of the dog chewing on a rat, even if it was instinct. Rats carry disease, and if Mrs. Lofton takes him to the vet a month from now, she'll know what happened. I decided to try and goad Rex with his leash and collar for a walk. Come on, boy. Let's go for a walk around the block, I told him. The hound immediately stood up and stretched, whining irritably as he trotted towards me. That's a good boy. You aren't so bad, are you? I said, carefully placing the collar on him. He kept making low noises. Couldn't tell if it was because he was uneasy around me or because he was still swallowing the last of that rat. Once the collar and leash were on, I tugged him to the front door. Mrs. Lofton has you on a tight schedule, but maybe we can shake things up, I suggested as he headed toward the street. Rex was hesitantly sniffing the ground and meandering down the street like a normal dog. And for a brief moment, I was sure that everything would turn out fine. Then one of the neighbors jogged by and Rex pulled me like a freight train, barking as his floppy ears jostled from side to side. The woman let out a soft cry of alarm and I tried to calm her as I pulled Rex, but I wasn't listening. He was reacting like any good watchdog I was ready to attack. Just eh, ignore him, he's old, I said, straining to pull him toward me. Rex turned and bit at my hand. I lost grip of his leash. In a heartbeat, he was down the street yelping and barking. The neighbors had jumped out of the way and was long gone. But if I didn't hurry, Rex would be too. 
Stupid dog, I muttered as I got up and followed after him. I knew he would have to give up eventually. About ten minutes later, that was exactly what happened, and I grabbed the leash and yanked Rex towards me. Cuh. Consider this the last walk you'll get for five days, I muttered as I marched back to Mrs. Lofton's house. The hound tried to pull against me, but I was firm. I felt a little bad for him, but I wasn't about to lose him in another frantic race. Once inside, I let him free and latched the door back, collapsing on the kitchen floor and tossing the house keys on the table. That was exhausting, I thought to myself as I watched him run to his water bowl. You're more of a handful than I bargained for, bud, I muttered as I went over and took off his leash. The dog stood stiff as if he was about to bite me again, and he growled in response. Yeah, yeah, I'll bark, no bite, I said, as I sunk back down into the recliner. I just wanted to relax for a few minutes, maybe get a power nap. But Rex had other ideas. Just as my eyelids got heavy and I was drifting to dreamland, the husky let out a low bark that nearly made me jump to the ceiling. He sat there, staring at me dead-eyed as I was in the recliner. "'What do you want?' I asked. He barked loud again, and I realized he wanted the chair. "'Fine, sure, it's your house,' I said as he climbed in the recliner at the moment I got out of it. "'You watch your programs. I'm going to get some sleep,' I told the dog dismissively. I kept it on Netflix and walked to the guest room, collapsing on the bed. That race across the neighborhood had drained me, and it was only day one. Closing my eyes, I kept thinking that Rex was going to come to the room and demand something with more sharp barks. Maybe it was my tired brain, but I felt certain that dog did come in the room and climb on my chest. I kept feeling this heavy pressure against my torso, and I kept fading in and out of being asleep, his dead eyes staring at me when I was awake. This dog was pushing my buttons. When I did wake up, I found Rex was still in the recliner, sitting almost like a person would as he watched his TV. Hope you cozy, I told him, as I walked over to the fridge to see what Mrs. Lofton had left me to eat. I'm not sure why I didn't notice it before, but when I opened the door this time and looked at the shelves, I realized the only things that weren't for Rex were a block of cheese and some prescription meds. Jesus... You really are spoiled, I said aloud as I closed the fridge back. I walked over to the table to grab the house keys, only to realize they were no longer there. Crap, they must have fallen off when I tossed them. I realized as I checked the grimy floor. Again, my phone was the only illumination as I crawled under the table and tried to see where they might have fallen. Just as I scanned the light towards the den, I saw the silhouette of Rex again in a frozen place. This time, there was no mistaking it. He was walking on his back legs to the guest room. What the hell? I scrambled up from the floor and pointed the light at him. Here, boy, I told the dog. He turned to look at me, still somehow standing upright like it was perfectly normal and didn't blink. Then he dropped back down to four legs and trotted into the guest room, somehow kicking the door closed and leaving me alone at the conundrum. I need some air, I told myself, as I searched for the keys. That was when I saw him, hanging above the stove. How did they get there? Had Rex put them there? No, that was that was impossible. I was just about to reach for them when my phone rang. It's Lofton. Hey, perfect timing. I, I had a question for you. Before I could even talk, she interrupted with a request for a dog. I did my best to not roll my eyes. Sure, what is it? She told me that he would need his favorite toy, and that she kept that toy in the basement near the water heater. The basement. Past the laundry, right? I got it, I said, turning and walking down the steps carefully. I had her on speakerphone as I commented, Ms. Lofton, has anyone ever told you how weird Rex is? It wasn't hard to miss the toy. It looked like a cabbage patch doll. Has he been good for you? Mrs. Lofton also asked as I reached down and grabbed the doll. That's one way of putting it. He enjoyed his walk earlier, I commented. As soon as I said it, I regretted telling her because it went against her rigorous instructions. It was fine, I reassured her. I turned to go back up the stairs and I heard the soft slam. I felt my heart drop. L Let me call you back, I said, as I was now in pitch darkness. Somehow the basement door had closed on me. No worries, just had to get up the steps. Then I reached for the handle and just as I was going to open it, I heard it snap and lock. Then I heard a low growl. 
Rex? How did the fucking dog lock me in the basement? Hey! Hey, listen to me! This isn't funny! Let me out! I said as I banged on the door. Only the low growl responded. This was insane. I sighed and turned back towards the basement, using my phone to get a good look around. Maybe I can get out of here some other way. I carefully climbed down the stairs, nearly tripping over more of Rex's toys. And then I went towards the back wall to see if there was some kind of hidden chute or something. But nothing was visible, except for crates of dog food. Jesus, this dog eats more than I do. I said as I checked it. Most of it was expired. There's no wonder Rex seemed so sickly. I slumped on the floor, feeling defeated and tired. If the dog wanted to lock me down here, so be it. I could deal with that for a few days, probably piss on the floor, eat dog food to survive. I wasn't sure what I was going to do about water, but I figured something had to go right after this shitty day. For a moment, I had also considered calling the police. But I knew that might cause more problems for me in the long run. If Mrs. Lofton found out I did something this monumentally stupid, I could kiss my paycheck goodbye. Instead, I decided to text my girlfriend. Signal was bad now, with the doors closed. I hear a storm approaching. Rex would probably tear up the house while I was down here. I'd hope she can get me out of here. You're locked in the basement? Her response made it sound like she thought it was my fault. Look, I'm not here to tell you the details. Can you help me or what? I don't get off work until after ten. Well, it's not like I'm going anywhere. I slipped the phone into my back pocket and walked up the stairs, attempting again to jiggle the door open. I couldn't hear Rex, but for some reason, I was sure the dog was somewhere nearby. Hey, you stupid dog, my girlfriend's coming by to get me out of here. And you better be nice when she gets here, I muttered. I wasn't exactly sure how Denise would even get in the house, but she was resourceful. She had to figure something out, I thought as I gritted my teeth and sat on the steps. First thing I do is lock Rex down here as a payback, I thought sourly, as rain began to pelt the house. I could hear the husky beginning to whine and bark. Storm upset him, just like Mrs. Lofton said it would. Then I heard the sound of glass breaking, and the dog clawing against a door. He was panicking, and so was I. How the hell was I going to fix this mess? I sighed, and I listened as the dog kept destroying the house, and I was powerless to stop him. So much for that pay, I thought. No, get a hold of yourself, Jeff. You, you have three more days. We can figure this out. Finally, it was nearly 10.30 at night. Rex had settled. Denise told me she was on her way, and I listened for her car to pull up. The storm had subsided, too, so I could hear everything that was happening. First, I heard her brakes and the car engine turn off, followed by her calling my name as she opened the front gate. This place is so creepy. Is this dog dangerous? I wasn't sure how to respond to that. Rex had reacted so strongly to the stranger earlier. What if... What if he attacked my girlfriend? Try to hurry. I can't be stuck down here for three more days. Denise texted back that the front door was actually wide open. That's impossible. I locked it. Denise's response wasn't very reassuring. Well, you did say the dog can open and close doors, right? I felt my heart skip a beat as I imagined Rex was off running around somewhere, but I couldn't worry about that. I told her to hurry to the basement. Power's out. I can't see a thing. I listened for her, trying to bang on the door to get her attention. Instead, I heard Rex make a terrible noise. It didn't sound like a dog at all. Denise let out a scream and Rex matched her tone and volume with every decibel. Then I heard the dog bound toward her and I frantically tried to open the door again as I heard my girlfriend fall to the floor. Her screaming continued as I heard the dog barking and snarling. I mean, I knew how vicious this dog could be, and all I could do was try to attract his attention to the basement. Loud banging and crashing filled the air for the next few minutes as Denise valiantly fought the dog. Then finally, the entire house went silent. I held my breath and I waited. Did she win? Did Rex kill her? I reached for my phone and texted her. I heard it softly ping somewhere in the house and I clenched my fist. If that dog had hurt her, I would make sure it never saw the light of day again. Instead, a moment later, the basement door unlatched and it opened. Denise was standing there, covered in scratches and fresh blood. I couldn't do much except for hug her. Then I immediately put my guard up and searched for the dog. Rex was nowhere to be seen. 
Guiding her to the guest room, I told Denise to stay there while I found the dog and put an end to this. It was still pitch dark, and I knew the husky would probably see me before I saw it. I moved to the den, searching for the fireplace poker. It would have to be a makeshift weapon. I heard a low creaking noise and nearly jumped out of my skin. The front door was open. I ran to the yard, realizing the gate was also open. Rex had escaped. My first thought was good riddance, and then... My phone buzzed. Mrs. Lofton. I'm quitting, I told my neighbor. This dog is insane. I got locked in the basement almost all night, and then Rex attacked my girlfriend. As I walked back to the kitchen, the power turned on and the lights flickered. Mrs. Lofton hadn't responded to my announcement, so I asked if she heard me. She claimed that Rex would never hurt anyone. Not her dog. She insisted that I video chat with her, and I sighed in frustration, nearly jumping out of my skin again, when I saw Rex at the end of the hall. There you are, you fucking monster, I said as I pulled out the video chat and walked to the hallway. You see? Rex is covered in my girl's blood, I said, focusing the camera on the husky. I stood by the guest room and unlatched the door, telling Denise that we were leaving. My eyes caught sight of something on the floor. A mess of hair and skin. My blood went cold, and my breath caught in my throat. It looked like a cocoon of flesh, peeled and dried out as if discarded. What the hell? Mrs. Lofton's face was pale and full of fear, and immediately she told me why. That... that wasn't her dog. I looked towards the husky and watched as the dog stood up on his hind legs again. This time its fur began to rescind and become skin. Its face distorted and resembled my girlfriend, naked, still covered in scratches. The fake Denise stepped towards me, half of her body still in the shape of the monstrous dog. I stumbled into the guest room, realizing the pound of flesh I had seen was what this creature had done to my real girlfriend, and then... I dropped the phone and I ran towards the door. The fake Denise shrieked and bounded towards me, shifting between dog and human as it tried to attack. I made it to my car and revved the engine, the creature standing in the middle of the street as it howled, sounding like a scream and a bark all at once. I pushed down on the pedals and slammed into the creature, flinging it over my windshield and shattering the glass. I didn't look back. I kept driving until I made it home and finally, finally I caught my breath. The next day, I used my brother's phone and I contacted the police. I tried to tell them everything that I knew that they would believe. They asked me to come to Lofton's residence, so we met around ten that morning. Much to my surprise, Mrs. Lofton had returned home. As the police explained the claim that I had made about Denise, my neighbor gave a confused look. She claimed to not even own a dog. The police searched the residence and found only the old dog food. She said Rex had died a few years ago, and there wasn't much to show that Denise had ever been there. Visibly frustrated, the police left and warned me about making false statements. I stood at the edge of the yard, staring at them in utter defeat, and then... then toward Mrs. Lofton on her porch. She was smiling, waved as they left. And I swear to you, I... I saw something behind her thin frame. A tail wagging. Her eyes shimmered for a second as she stared at me, and... And I immediately drove off. The thing had lured me here, and likely planned to kill me originally before Denise showed up. I told my co-worker to never take the job from her again. And I told myself... I'm never dog-sitting. No lists of rules, evil AIs, or cursed objects appear in the story. It doesn't take place in a haunted apartment, a supernatural forest, or secret laboratory. There aren't any ghosts or demons either. Although I suppose you could say that there are monsters. The year was 2007. It was after midnight on a Thursday night, and my best friend Sean and I had nowhere to go. I was a wannabe writer. He was a wannabe artist. And we had $29 between us that somehow had to buy all of our food and gas until the end of the month. 
That night, we discovered a half-empty bottle of Everclear vodka behind a fake panel in the wall of our apartment. It was like finding buried treasure. We poured it into two bottles along with some expired orange juice, trusting the alcohol to kill off any bacteria. We set out for a walk. Walking, at least, was free. In those days, it was our main recreational activity. Instead of going through the historic district or out by the meatpacking plant, we headed along one of our main railroad tracks that crisscrossed our town. We'd had some close calls before, but we'd always managed to scurry into the bushes when a train came roaring through. Well, so far anyway. Maybe... Maybe it was the booze. But I felt bored with the railroad tracks that night. I wanted to explore one of the gravel roads that led away from the tracks. There were dozens of them. Strange little paths that led up into the tree-lined hills or down into the dark gullies behind the tracks. I picked one at random, and Sean sighed when he saw how steep it was. Fueled by curiosity and vodka screwdrivers, we trudged up into the woods. We hadn't gone far when I began to suspect that maybe, just maybe, we'd made an awful mistake. I felt... watched. Although I couldn't see anyone among the trees... The hair on the back of my neck was starting to stand up. Goosebumps covered Sean's arms, and one look in his eyes told me that he was feeling it too. We didn't dare to speak. Not a single word might break the spell causing God knows what to come charging at us from the depths of the woods. How far were we from town now? Forty-five minutes? An hour? Help would never get to us in time if we called for it. There was no one around to hear us scream. There was a heavy, silent, expectant feeling in the air, like someone or something was awaiting the arrival of our crunching footsteps. I couldn't tell what it was at first, that black shape looming beyond the horizon of the hill. To our overactive imaginations, it looked almost like a ruined castle. As it turned out, it was an abandoned rock quarry. That feeling of being observed only intensified as we entered the ring of crumbled, graffiti-covered walls and huge machines we couldn't identify. I felt drawn to the building to the right, but maybe I just wanted to get out of the line of sight of the concrete tower at the far end of the quarry, the one with narrow windows that stared down at us like empty eye sockets. Approaching the building, Sean and I were hit by a foul smell. A weird mix of diesel fuel, sweat, piss, and something else I couldn't identify. We turned on the flashlights on our phones and stepped through the doorless entrance. The moment I saw the filthy torn-up clothes and mattresses inside, I wanted to go get out of here. And I'm sure that Sean did, too. But running meant facing whatever might be waiting for us on the road back, and neither of us were ready to do that. Not yet. Shaky phone flashlights in our hands, we kept going, stepping over junk, half-glimpsed in the dark. A decapitated teddy bear. A pink plastic bowl full of maggots. A long hallway of metal doors. One of them screeched as it swung open on rusted hinges. Was someone else here? We kept going until we reached the end of the hallway, where a concrete staircase led upwards. Sean opened his mouth to say something, but stopped when he heard footsteps behind us. Whoever they were, they could walk just fine in the dark. And they had no trouble staying out of the reach of our dim phone flashlights. Hello? There was no response. Sean and I headed up the staircase, afraid to go forward, but even more afraid to go back. Upstairs, more rusty metal doors, some of them were padlocked. From behind one, we heard weeping. In other rooms, multiple voices held hushed conversations. Some in languages we couldn't understand. Behind the door beside us, an orange glow flickered. Like firelight. The footsteps behind us grew closer, racketing up my nerves until I didn't dare to turn around. The door beside us swung open. Now I saw the source of the orange glow, some burning rags on a broken plate. I caught glimpses, shadows of figures moving inside. But most of my attention was fixed on the large, bearded man who burst out of the room, jabbing his finger into my chest and shoving me. 
Spit flew out between the gaps created by his missing teeth. His breath reeked of vomit and sickness. Red, worm-like veins stood out on his face as he screamed at me. I had no idea what he was saying, but the meaning was clear. I watched in slow motion as he picked up a chunk of rubble, reared back with it. The footsteps that had been following us came running out of the dark. A dirty, snot-nosed kid tugged on the man's sleeve. He hesitated for a second, and that was all Sean and I needed. We sprinted down the hallway, pursued by eerie echoing shouts and hurled hunks of rock. There was a rickety fire escape at the end of the hall. We'd barely started to climb down when the headlights appeared on the gravel tracks below. Something about their brightness made me feel like a hunted animal, and I gestured for Sean that we should hide. Sticks and briars jabbed through our jeans as we climbed up the wooded hillside and squatted down behind a half-rotted log. Three black vans parked in front of the abandoned quarry. There was something ominous about the way that they left their engines running. Five men got out of the vans and rushed inside the building where we'd found the man and child. Their shadows were long and freakish in the headlights, and while I couldn't make out their faces, I did catch the glint of a nickel-plated pistol. More shouts echoed from inside. We could see flashlight beams dancing in the hollow windows. The five men marched thirty people out of the ruined building and marched them into the rumbling vans. The whole thing couldn't have taken more than five minutes. But I swear I saw the kid who'd been following us look up into the hills and give a little nod before disappearing into the darkness of the rumbling, unmarked van. I finally understood. The man and the boy, they... They hadn't been threatening us, they'd been warning us, trying to get us out of there before it was too late. With the vans locked up and ready to go, I got a better look at the five armed men, and what I saw gave me chills. They looked completely normal. A short, chubby guy with a goatee, a blonde kid not much older than me, who kept checking his phone, an older man with a leathery face and a ball cap who I'd seen a few times in bars around town, and two others with their backs to me, all of them calmly smoking cigarettes and telling jokes like they hadn't just kidnapped dozens of people at gunpoint. One of the men opened a canvas bag that he was holding. It looked like it was full of passports and documents. And he set fire to them one by one with the tip of his cigarette. When they'd finished their smoke break, they left the smoldering sack on the ground and drove off with their human cargo. It was like they were never there. Almost half an hour passed before Sean and I dared to move from our hiding spot. The same question was in both of our minds as we trade carefully down the anonymous gravel road. What the hell had we just seen? I wanted to go to the police with our story. Without any evidence, who would believe us? Besides, as Sean pointed out, we'd have to explain what we were doing on the quarry's property in the middle of the night, reeking of alcohol. A few days later, a black and white poster on a roadside rest area caught my eye. I saw two faces that I'd recognized. A pudgy guy with a goatee, older man with a leathery face wearing a ball cap. Both were wanted in connections with a human trafficking ring. They brought hundreds of people into the country on false pretenses, destroyed their documents and shipped them off to work as forced labor. Or worse. Sean and I had unwittingly stumbled onto one of those transport hubs of their operation. I'd always thought that human trafficking or something that happened to people was far away. Somewhere at shipping ports, border crossings, international airports. I, I never would have imagined. It was in the sleepy college town where I lived. But maybe... Maybe that was the genius of it. There was a lot of abandoned buildings in Midwest America. There was a lot of gravel roads with no clear end in sight. In the quietest towns, maybe even your town, there are a lot of places where evil can hide. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Cutie Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to let you know about a new audiobook currently available on Amazon from Erie River Publishing. It Calls from the Sea, narrated by yours truly and written by the wonderful authors over at Erie River, is available exclusively on Audible. It's 25 amazing horror stories all about the horrors of the deep, stories from the sea 
and those horrors from the deep that find their way on land. It was a lot of fun being able to work on this book last year, and I'm really glad to be able to see it come out. If you guys are interested in picking it up, hearing some of these great stories, and helping to support some of those wonderful folks over at Erie River, check out the link in the description down below, or you can always just search for Mr. Creepypasta on Audible to find all the books that I've worked on. And now, on to tonight's story. My adventures as the sorcerer's new apprentice had taken me to a distant and chaotic dimension. Far from Xavier, my mentor. Braving the strange lands to follow the girl of my dreams and also my sworn enemy. I had almost died on several occasions before discovering the entrance to the Chaos Kid's underground lair. And in the process, I discovered I possessed the mysterious and powerful force known as Chaos Magic. Although I didn't entirely know what that meant. We were currently fighting in the cavernous underbelly of the Chaos World, where I had followed Bruca, thinking she was going to see her master. The Dark Wizard was pulling her strings, making her his puppet, and playing a wicked counterpart to my own mentor, who was trying desperately to save the multiverse from destruction. Xavier didn't know I was here, but if he did, I had a feeling he would be proud of my bravery. I was doing everything in my power to stop the destruction of the multiverse. Meanwhile, all Bruca and the Dark Wizard wanted was to destroy it turn it into a dark abyss, to start over in the most nihilistic way possible. The Chaos Kid seemed to have a similar mindset, although he thought that his goals were different and unique. If he destroyed everything, there would be chaos for sure. But chaos always leads back to order, and anarchy leads to the strongest and the most powerful bullies getting their way all the time. That would be the New World Order under Bruca and the Dark Wizard. Anyway, back to the matter at hand. I was currently in a face-off with two of the last three remaining apprentices, a Mexican standoff where the three of us were holding our wands out, ready to attack and kill one another at a moment's notice. My nemesis Bruca and the Chaos Kid had their hands gripped tightly around the hilts of their wands and looked ready to attack. My own hand was trembling as I thought about the possibilities of what might happen next. My knees were wobbly and my mouth was dry, my senses more focused than they'd ever been. If I made one misstep, one false move... I'd be dead, and no one would ever find my body. I winced and shielded my face with my hands as a blast of dark energy erupted from Bruca's wand. The Chaos Kid unleashed a similar burst of red, malignant-looking energy from his own wand. His reminded me of Maximum Carnage from Spider-Man, a vine-like gooey burst of red-melted Twizzlers. When the two forces came together, there was an outburst of power which sent me reeling backwards, crashing into the rock wall behind me. The two of them were unaffected by the blast and continued battling in front of me, ignoring me where I lay bleeding on the ground. My head hit the rock wall behind me and I realized the world was fading into blackness, my vision filling with black pixelation. Perfect, I thought to myself. This is just perfect. I'm gonna die down here once they're done killing each other. And everything went black. Then I woke up in another place. It was bright and sunny. There was green grass beneath my bare feet. Up and ahead was a lake of clear crystal blue water, and there were people running and playing on its shores. Children dove from the dock and splashed each other in the water while swimming. But despite this happy scene, there was another one playing out a little ways away. And that scene was so strange it drew my attention. I found myself wandering over towards the group of people. A man and a woman were standing in a different dock set aside from where the children played. The two of them were young, maybe in their twenties, and they were looking out at the water where someone was splashing around. Then I realized they weren't playing in the water. Whoever this was, they were drowning. But the man and woman didn't seem to care. I ran over to them, screaming, Hey, she's drowning out there! Don't, don't you see she's drowning? Racing past the people on the dock, I was about to jump off the end when I noticed something. The woman had her hand outstretched, and she was holding her palm down as if from a distance, pressing down on the girl's head, forcing it underwater. She was... using magic, I realized. And the man beside her, her husband, probably, is just watching as she drowned the poor girl out in the water. Each time the young girl's head came up for a moment, I saw the terror on her face. Her black hair covered most of her visage, and I didn't notice her eyes right away. But then I caught a glimpse of them and saw they were the same distinctive shade of purple. 
possessed by only one girl that I'd ever met. Ruka. I looked at the face of the man beside me, standing on the dock. Slowly, it all began to make sense. Xavier? I asked, looking at my mentor standing there, just watching his daughter drown. Xavier, help her! I screamed at him. Why are you doing this? I tried to grab his arm to push him into the water, but I just went right through him like a ghost. What are you doing to her? Why are you doing this? I yelled again, but got no answer from either of them. Each time Bruca came up for air, she was more blue in the face, more wild-eyed and terrified. Finally, after what felt like forever, it stopped. The woman turned her hand over and raised her up out of the water with a simple gesture, causing her body to levitate toward her until she was hovering over the water, soaking wet and pouring liquid from her clothing. The woman was terrifying, whoever she was. I was scared just standing next to her, thinking that at any moment she might snap her gaze to look at me. Despite the fact that they couldn't see me, she continued to ignore me, though, and looked at her daughter instead. Dear, I'm doing this for you. Now I want you to tell me again how you transmogrify a cat and turn it into a frog. If you can't do it, then I'll just have to keep going. Bruca belched, and a half bucket full of water poured out of her mouth, as well as what looked like a small frog, coincidentally. Without skipping a beat, Bruca began to speak. You take half a pinch of witch hazel, six virgin tears, a phlegm of a goat, two dog whiskers, combined with two quarts of calf's blood, stir in a cauldron over an open flame on low heat for two hours until a paste forms. Find a local cat. Uh-huh. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You forgot a step, sweetie. The horrible woman called out across the water. You need to drain the mixture through a sieve first before proceeding any further. Bruca's face drained of any remaining color, and she began to scream in protest. No! No, no! I, I don't want to do this anymore! You can't keep- But her cries were cut off by the sound of water filling her lungs, as her own mother dunked her head between the waves again. The only sounds left were the wind and the distant cries of children playing in the water. I followed the family as they walked home, holding hands and talking amongst themselves after several more torturous hours of this disturbing teaching method. Somewhere, I'd heard that there had been a study done proving that traumatic events make lasting memories that can never be erased. The pieces fit together in my mind, and as they walked home, I listened to their conversation. I realized all of this was normal in this world. It was a teaching method, a way to retain information through trauma. Wherever we were, it couldn't possibly be Earth, could it? It definitely looked like Earth. I just wish I was normal, like the other kids, Bruca said to her mom and her dad as they walked. Why can't I play with them? Why can't I go to school with them? Her mother pulled her in with a hard yank of her arm. Because we're not like them, understand? We're different. You're different. You need to act like it. I ran ahead and looked at Xavier's face, not understanding how he could be so callous, so cruel to his own daughter. What's wrong with you, Xavier? How could you do this to your own daughter? But he just continued looking straight through me. Even though we got inside their house and Bruca went straight to her room, I followed her there and waited until she was alone before trying to speak to her. Despite the change in Xavier's age and appearance, Bruca looked about the same. Still a girl around my age, but I didn't understand how that was possible. She shut the door to her bedroom and sunk down to the floor, clutching her knees. She began to cry uncontrollably. I got down onto the floor beside her and put my arm around her despite the fact that it passed right through her like a ghost. It's okay, I said. Everything's gonna be okay. I'm sorry your parents are such assholes. My heart stopped in my chest as she spoke back to me. Thanks. They are assholes, aren't they? I didn't know what to say at first. Then, after a few moments, I shuddered a reply. You can see me? Yeah, and I can hear you too. 
This is a memory, dummy. You're in my memories right now. A serious breach of privacy, too, if I do say so myself. Oh, sorry, I guess you're right. This is kind of personal. She sighed. It's okay. I'm kind of glad you're here. This is where it all comes from, I guess. My hatred of mankind, desire for destruction, nihilistic mentality. It all stems from this one stupid unforgettable day and a bunch of almost equally bad days before and after that's pretty insightful of you to say that if you know that though why don't you change i mean why let this trauma take over your life you're you're being exactly what she wants you to be a horrible heartless person xavier isn't like this anymore she cut me off by grabbing my throat and squeezing it hard enough to cut off my air supply don't you say his name to me right now He's not better than this. He is still the same piece of shit who did this to me all those years ago. I tried to squeak back a reply, but I couldn't. And now it's time for me to end it all. To get rid of everything. Including him. I couldn't breathe. Much less speak. But after a few moments, she let go. Sorry, I rasped. You're right. I shouldn't defend him. I'm I'm pissed with him for watching that happen and not doing anything. This might actually be the end of our relationship. I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't know if I can learn from someone who can do this to his own daughter. I don't know if I can be around him after seeing that. It's too much. I'm traumatized just seeing it. I can't imagine how you must feel. She softened her gaze and actually smiled at me. It had been a long time, but I hadn't forgotten it from the first day I'd seen her in the woods, even if it had been a phony smile to steal Xavier's key from me. And it had stuck with me. She had a beautiful smile. You mean it? You're not just saying it. Yeah, I do. I mean, of course I do. I care about you. Even if you do try to kill me every time we meet. She looked at me for a long, long time, not saying anything, her cheeks beginning to color with a blush. She huffed. Ugh. You're really frustrating, you know that? What do you mean? I asked. Well, first, I thought you were just a brat Xavier was going to train for a while and then get tired of or get killed. But you just keep sticking around and... She paused, something dawning on her. Her eyes widened further and further. What? I asked. Her face getting redder, but this time, it wasn't a flirty blush. I realized. She was pissed. You son of a bitch! You and your fucking emo magic! How could I let you do this to me? E emo magic? I... Oh right, I forgot I had that. But I don't even know how to use it, I tried to protest. But then my eyes snapped open and I was back in the cavern again, looking on as Bruca sat a bolt of lightning through the skull of the Chaos Kid, splitting him in half from top to bottom, his body split into two equal pieces, and fell away as she strode through them, her boots squelching through the bloody puddles of viscera and gore. Without missing a stride, she reached down and picked up his wand, holding it up to her own. I watched in horror as her already large wand grew even bigger, until it was the size of a scepter. Nearly as big as Xavier's staff now. She was more powerful than ever. Way stronger than me. You! She spit, the giant wand pointing straight at me. You don't make me feel things. Nobody makes me feel things! And with that, she shot a bolt of energy at me, clearly intending to kill me. I held up my own wand, yelling the first thing that came to mind, not really that surprised to hear what it was. Vines! I shouted desperately. Vines! 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 A moment later, I was rocketing out of the caverns through the ceiling above, propelled by a jack-in-the-beanstalk vine which grew rapidly towards the heavens, carrying me with it through tons of sheer stone. That's gonna leave a mark, and time to think, before I lost consciousness once again. The last thing I noticed was my hands leaving the giant vine as it broke through the clouds, high up in the sky. And then... I was falling.
While waiting in line at the store for a self-checkout terminal, a man casually settled up beside me and asked if I had mind lending him a few dollars. You know, he was short on cash. I glanced at his hand basket, saw that he only had a few items. It was fruit, water bottle, a pack of tuna, a loaf of bread. And I went ahead and offered to just pay for his groceries. Seeing as how the cost wouldn't be more than 10 or 15 dollars, I hadn't put much in my cart, so our combined totals wouldn't even break the bank. So, I mean, he looked at me as if I'd offered him my kidney or something, right? His eyes water up, his lips quivering. Before he could say anything, I told him that it'd be alright, you know, that I, I wouldn't mind at all. I nudged my cart over so that he could deposit his items. He gave a heartful smile, he nodded his head, added his items to the cart. The line cleared, I paid for what we'd gathered, gave him his items. As gratefully as he could, he thanked me, shook my hand. We parted ways. I went home with that little warm feeling in my chest that arises after you've done a nice thing for someone, and I hoped that he'd pass on the gesture to someone else. Well, he did, but um, not in the way I expected. The following day, I went back to the same store to grab a drink and a snack about the same time that I'd gone yesterday. It mildly surprising, the same man was also there. Again, his handheld basket carried the same few items. He saw me. Our eyes met. For a moment, I thought, oh boy, <laughs> I hope he isn't some kind of grifter, you know, getting strangers to buy him things every day. But then he smiled and he pointed at the drink and chips in my hand gestured for me to put them in his basket. I complied, thanking him, shared a laugh at the coincidental nature of it all. He gave me my things, we parted ways again, having developed a little grocery store friendship. I saw him again three days later, at the same store, at the same time. Again, he carried a basket with only a few items. Those single-serve packets of tuna, some fruit, a loaf of bread, a couple of bottles of water. Something about the regularity of our meeting and his seemingly unchanged diet, it, it unnerved me. Despite the man's completely harmless appearance and outward nature, I nonetheless felt that there was something off about him. I didn't want to sour the little acquaintanceship that we'd developed, so I waved and politely asked about his Spartan diet. He laughed and replied that they were just the items that he went through most often, assuming me that his palate wasn't so limited. I'd have no room to criticize, considering my own relatively simple tastes. Considering the interaction over, I said, see you later, and went over to the next available self-checkout terminal. As I finished scanning my last items and prepared to pay, he came up beside me, resting his basket on the counter. He locked eyes with me and said, have you forgotten? It's your turn to cover things. I was taken aback. I mean, since I had never once thought that it'd be a regular thing, us paying for each other's items each time that we happened to meet, but not wanting to make a scene and having enough money to cover everything, I complied, even sheepishly apologizing for having forgotten. <laughs> His present smile broadened, and he nodded in thanks. He took his portion of the bags and departed, leaving me more than a little disturbed. Still, nothing actually hostile had happened, so I didn't want to make a fuss about it to the staff, who I'm sure hadn't even noticed our odd exchange. At that moment, I did decide to never again visit the store at the same time, you know, just so I wouldn't have to deal with him again. I couldn't cover his purchase forever, right? A few days later... I was back at the store. Only I'd gone before work, you know, at 7 a.m., when the store first opened. I was the first one in. I felt a huge relief at seeing the self-checkout completely clear when I'd gathered what I needed. But just as I was about to hit pay now on the touchscreen, a hand stopped me. Turning, I, I... I saw him, standing there with a smile on his face, and his same peculiar assortment of items in his cart. I, 
utterly shocked I just stood there. That using his needlessly solid grip on my hand, he lightly pushed me aside. He proceeded to quietly scan his own items, then selected pay now, and inserted his money. Despite the charitable gesture, there was an almost palpable aura of malice about him. As if this kind act was somehow subtly unkind. It honestly freaked me out. And I would have just left, you know, abandoning the roughly $45 in groceries if he hadn't been holding onto my hand. But then the machine spat out the receipt, he deposited it into one of my bags, and he released his grip. I didn't even bother thanking him. I just, I grabbed my stuff, headed to the front. Before I could exit, he called out, Remember, next time's on you. I, I didn't respond. I, I practically ran to my car. For the next round of groceries, a week later, I went to a completely different store on the other side of town. But still, there was a feeling of trepidation as I gathered my items, pushing my cart carefully, peeking around corners, hoping not to spot him. I even avoided the aisles that held items that he'd consistently purchased, dreading to see him browsing the shelves. Finally ready to pay and leave, I walked towards the self-checkout, as a death row inmate might walk to the chair, each step carrying a grim weight. My fears and anxieties were confirmed, you know, even though I hadn't seen him anywhere in the store. He was there, waiting behind an old woman who was doubtlessly oblivious to the man's almost logic-defying presence. I hadn't made a sound in my approach, but he... He still turned around as if sensing me. He smiled, he raised his basket, and there were the same usual items. A register opened and he nodded towards it, motioning for me to go ahead, head over, and as if being led by some terrible fate of unyielding hands, I went to the register, but even though I'd followed his order, I swore to myself then and there that I wouldn't pay for his items. I began scanning my things. All the while, I was sensing his gaze, knowing that he was waiting for me to finish before coming over and adding his own. When the last items were scanned, I carefully retrieved my card from my wallet, not wanting to show this man how utterly terrified I was. And as expected, he came over, and he began unloading his basket onto the counter. With enough force to stop them, but not enough to draw attention. I put my hand down and whispered, no. It took a mad fight against my nerves, but I managed to look up and meet his gaze. And for the first time, I noticed how off his eyes were. Not necessarily like in their alignment on his face, but the way they stared, the the smoldering intensity behind an otherwise normal pedestrian appearance. It was an expression of someone who had been born unhinged and had only adapted to normal sane society rather than someone who had slowly cracked under some great stress or pressure. Somehow my resolve held. I didn't back down from the face of carefully contained lunacy. He smiled, and, and to my complete surprise, began returning his items to his basket, not wasting the opportunity to escape. I, I inserted my card, I paid, I gathered my bags. Risking a look back, I saw him talking to another man, who, after inclining his head to listen, shrugged his shoulders and nodded. My unhinged acquaintance then put the items in the man's cart, and together they headed to the register that I had just left. A sense of duty to my fellow man compelled me to warn the guy. I mean, even at some unknown risk to my own person, I... I started to head over, right? And... Something grabbed my arm at the last moment. It was a woman, someone I'd never seen before. She looked utterly depressed. Her hair disheveled, her eyes sunken, her cheeks hollow as if she'd had some... fat removal operation. Quietly, she pulled me aside. Don't. 
You have a day, maybe two. What you have in your cart there, you can live off of that for a week. I looked down, automatically assessing the contents, even as I shuddered at the urgency in her voice. I'd spent around $75, which I knew wouldn't last me very long these days. I met her gaze, and she must have seen the doubt on my face, because she pulled me closer and said, Doesn't matter. Just eat as conservatively as you can. That man over there, the one that you've presumably been bumping into here, or at least at the other stores, he is psychotic. And that's if he's even human. He's gotten the same stuff every time, right? Tuna, fruit, water, bread. Never deviating from that. How do I know? Because that's what I sent my husband off to get six months ago. He'd never told me how he bumped into the stranger. Who would ask him if he could pay for something. A dictionary, a book of maps. My husband complied, figuring the man would be homeless or something like that. My husband had those items in his cart. The tuna, the water, the fruit, the bread. He said that they parted ways on friendly terms, but the man had seemed off. Strange in an undeniable way. Well, he saw him again the next day, grabbing some other things we needed. This time, the stranger had a cart, and the same items my husband had bought the day before were in there. The stranger paid for my husband's items, being just as friendly as he had been before. But then they met up again. And I'm sure you can guess what items were in the man's basket. There was a certain mania in her eyes. One that was obviously born of long-held anxiety, if not full-blown terror. But she wasn't crazy. She wasn't crazy like him. She had experienced something awful. And hadn't been able to truly express herself to someone until meeting me. Hearing the ding of items being scanned at a leisurely pace behind me, I told her to continue. Finally, my husband said no. That he wouldn't pay for the man's items anymore. He'd grown uncomfortable with the whole affair. He said the man didn't seem to be offended. I allowed my husband to finish checking out unbothered. My husband came home, told me about what had happened. We had a little laugh at the absurdity of it all. And then the next day I came home from work to find several grocery bags on the kitchen counter. We hadn't needed groceries. He'd stocked up the last time, presumably so that we wouldn't have to deal with the man for a while. So I was understandably upset by how much he'd spent. But before I could even call out to him, I saw the puddle. I saw the puddle beneath the table. It was bright red, still expanding via a steady stream of crimson from the table's surface. The inner animal part of me understood at once, but still I continued forward. My conscious mind, unbelieving, unable to accept that anything so monstrous could have happened in our civilized society. I opened the bag nearest the edge of the table and I saw my husband's face staring up at me, pale, lifeless. He'd been savagely dismembered and bagged. I immediately knew who the culprit was. I called the police when I managed to... to recover. But they didn't do much, couldn't. The man's face was mysteriously blurred on the store's security footage. There'd never been a clear shot of him. Eventually, I mustered the courage to wait around the store, and eventually I saw him. Tracked him. I've tried pointing him out, but his face... it's never clear. The police refused to take any actions, not wanting to risk causing trouble for some random person. Afraid to be sued, I guess. But I know they think I'm crazy. But you don't, right? You've been through it. You know what he's like. It's why I'm telling you to leave here. Go as far away as you can. My husband may have been the first, but you aren't... You aren't the second. I've watched him do this to others. I've tried to warn them. I hope that they've listened. I'll approach the man myself, confront him in front of everyone. But I'm scared. You can't blame me, can you? After what he did to my husband, I can't fight him. I won't try to, but I can 
warn others, even if it means driving every store in town out of business or making a fool of myself to strangers. With a final tearful smile, she ushered me ahead of her. I, I glanced back. I saw the allegedly murderous stranger shaking hands with his latest friend. And I hurried out the door. I hope the woman manages to convincingly warn him before it's too late. The door is locked, and the gaps are plugged with towels, but I don't think it'll make any difference. I hear my neighbors driving by outside the barricaded window, completely unaware of the horrors taking place inside this house. I guess I just want someone else to know the truth. It started as these things often do, with something completely unexpected. An event that came screeching in out of the dark to smash the quiet life that I'd built for my wife, Alice, and our son, Jake. We tried so hard to childproof our house. We protected the power outlets, used baby gates, and stored dangerous chemicals far out of reach. I don't know where Jake got a hold of that small glass bead. I mean, maybe he found it outside, in the street, or at the playground. All I know is, the moment he swallowed it, that little ball of glass cut off his air supply completely. Alice and I tried desperately to remember the Heimlich maneuver and perform it on our squirming, crying, purple-faced child. But we only made things worse. By the time the EMT arrived, Jake had stopped breathing. He lay in my wife's arms, limp and lifeless as a rag doll, drool dribbling out of his bluish lips. The looks on the paramedics' faces when they finally arrived told us everything we needed to know. Despite their best resuscitation efforts, our son was gone. I still remember the way that my wife's hot tears soaked through my shirt as we walked out to the ambulance with Jake. I just wanted to hold his tiny hand until the last minute, until they loaded him into that sterile metal box and the doors closed on him forever. Then, suddenly, Jake grabbed my finger. His eyes snapped open, and with a pop, the cat's eyes beat, popped out of his mouth. The paramedics couldn't believe it. The resuscitation efforts had ended eight minutes ago, and Jake, Jake had been legally dead for almost half an hour. Lazarus Syndrome, they called it. <laughs> but, I mean, I didn't care about names or diagnoses. I didn't care about tests and trials, clinical statistics. I was just happy to have my son back. And Jake was quieter than I remembered before. His, his big blue eyes had sparked like sunlight on the sea. But now, now, however, they seemed darker, deeper somehow. Like, like I was looking into a still bottomless pool. I found that I couldn't maintain eye contact with him for long. Maybe that was the first sign. Maybe that's when I should have acted. But it's too late now. And like most new parents, Alice and I had been terrified to leave Jake's side at first. We kept his crib in our bedroom. But I mean, after his recovery, we found we couldn't sleep with Jake nearby. He would, he would stand and stare at us all night, his hands grabbing the bars of his crib like a death row inmate in teddy bear pajamas. Although Alice and I never talked about it, we could, we could both feel his gaze probing at the back of our skulls, as though he was trying to drill them open and let something in. A few weeks later, we moved Jake's crib into my office. That's why we were so terrified to find him in bed with us at 3 a.m. the next night. He lay, sucking his thumb with one hand, and had the other on Alice's hip in a way that seemed strangely adult and possessive. Worse still, when I looked at that hand out of the corner of my eye, it didn't seem like a toddler's arm at all. 
it looked stretched, hairy, and horrible. When I carried my sleeping son back to his crib, I wondered if I was having some kind of psychological reaction to the trauma of Jake's death and unexpected resuscitation. That could have been the only explanation for the things that I was seeing and feeling. Right? As I put Jake back in his crib, I noticed something red on his lip. With awful adult intelligence, he quickly tried to hide it from me, but I spun him back around. Jake opened his mouth wide. A waterfall of blood poured out. I'd never, I'd never seen so much in my life. I screamed for Alice and looked around for something, anything, to stop the bleeding. Behind me, I could hear the gory stream spattering on the floor. That wasn't all. When I turned again, hundreds of round cat's eye beads were dribbling from my son's mouth. What? Alice burst into the room with a shout. I pointed to Jake. But, but he was fine. Our son sat sleepily in his crib with a puzzled expression on his face as though he was concerned about my weird behavior. I tried to stammer an explanation to Alice on our walk back to bed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that my son was laughing silently at me behind my back. From there, things only got worse. The next night, I woke from a revolting dream in which a giant leech was writhing around inside of my sheet, sucking me dry. And just like in the dream, there was a, a weight on my chest when I woke. It was Jake giggling as he crawled around our bed. It was all I could do to keep myself from shoving him off of me. This is your son, I told myself. You love him. And it was true. But more and more I was starting to wonder whether the thing inside the crib was really Jake at all. I installed a bolt on Jake's bedroom door. Surely that would stop his late night wanderings. But the next night, my son was back in bed with us again. I placed a motion-activated camera in the hallway, hoping to figure out how on earth Jake had opened the bolt. And what I saw in that eerie night vision footage... That will haunt me for the rest of my life. Something slid beneath my son's door. A hand. At first it looked like Jake's, but as the arm stretched upwards towards the lock and the fingers extended, it, its appearance changed into something monstrous. My son's arm had somehow passed beneath the door, reached all the way up its length, and unbolted its lock with clawed, hairy fingers. The hideous arm retracted, the door creaked open, and Jake... Jake crawled along the ceiling towards our bedroom. The last still image the camera captured was Jake's freakishly extended foot and snarling face as he kicked it away. I watched the clip again and again, unable to reconcile what I'd seen with the toddler dozing peacefully just a few feet away. During the day, Jake was completely normal. He threw tantrums, colored, played with his toys, asked a few questions every five seconds. He fell asleep, eating his Cheerios. Maybe... Maybe it was just at night when he... When he would... A sudden thump jolted me out of my reverie. Jake was awake. In fact, he was standing right next to me, a lifeless expression on his face. He just slammed his little fist onto my computer right above the port. I'd inserted the camera's SD card. Was, was he trying to destroy the video? Thump! Jake brought his fist down two more times with impossible strength, shattering my laptop's fragile plastic covering and the SD card inside. And, and that wasn't all. My mind didn't want to process it. I couldn't process it. But Jake... Jake had grown taller than me. 
I looked down in horror at the extra 40 inches of deformed flesh that started at my son's pajama bottoms and extended in the clawed feet on the floor. I shut my eyes and clamped down a scream, and when I opened them again, Jake was crawling around the rug, completely fixated on the toy truck in front of him. His face and body were completely normal. But my laptop... My laptop was a broken mess. Jake, or whatever was inside of him, was... It was getting more powerful. Alice and I felt hunted inside our own home. Whenever we tried to discuss what was happening to Jake, we'd hear his tiny feet scurrying impossibly fast, and suddenly he'd be standing right beside us, listening watching with those dark blue endlessly deep eyes after what happened last night i suppose i can't blame alice i can't, I can't blame alice for leaving I, i'd spent the day installing a key operated lock on jake's bedroom door i set up a baby camera in the room that streamed live to alice and i in case he needs us i told myself but the truth was i'd set it up for our own protection if jake started if he started to change, we'd know about it. The new setup was supposed to help us sleep, but in the end, Alice and I just lay awake, watching what was happening on the other side of the baby camera. We stared at our perfectly normal, snoring, thumb-sucking toddlers, though we were watching a tense scene in a horror movie, the kind so terrifying that it's impossible to look away. We'd gone without sleep for so long, I, I suppose it was only a matter of time. I couldn't blame Alice when she dozed off on my shoulder. And I kept nodding off as well. I tried to tell myself that one of us needed to keep watching. But every time I looked up, the scene on the screen was unchanged. The small, cute shape of Jake in his onesie pajamas, one arm around his teddy bear. Maybe things are fine now. The treacherous, exhausted part of my mind whispered to me, maybe, maybe the danger, or whatever it was, maybe it's past. My chin hit my chest. My eyes popped open with a start. A dark shape, probably Jake's teddy bear, lay in front of the camera, blocking it. And where was our son? Mm -hmm. At first, I didn't notice the sound coming from beside me. I turned slowly, almost not wanting to see, and saw Jake's monstrous fingers toying with my wife's hair. His open mouth pressed against hers, and something bulky and hideous was sliding down her throat. Although whether Jake was draining something out of Alice or infesting her with something of his own, I couldn't tell. My whole world became that horrible, strangled sound. Those two entangled fingers lit only by the eerie green glow of the screen and my own paralyzing fear. Alice's hand struggling feebly, trying to pry Jake off of her face. It was only then that I found the strength to act. I grabbed Jake from behind and pulled... It took both of our combined strength to pry him, screeching and flailing off Alice's face, both of their mouths still covered with a lipstick smear coated of bright red blood. Alice coughed and spit something up, a tiger's eye glass bead. She stared at it for a long second, and then... And then... She grabbed her purse, and she walked out the door. I could hear Jake giggling beside me as Alice started her car in the misty 4 a.m. darkness. Even then, I knew in my heart I'd, I'd never see her again. I'd been home alone with Jake since then. He's been testing the boundaries, changing more often and more obviously. I think he knows that no help is coming for me. I could hear him running through the house, laughing, smashing things for fun. It's only a matter of time now. I'm not afraid of death. The moment Alice left, I accepted my fate. No, see... What I'm afraid of is... What if... 
death isn't the end? What if, after whatever Jake does to me, I just... I just wake up again and spit a tiger's eye ball of glass out onto the floor? What if I wake up as something else? Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepy Pasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to let you know about a new audiobook currently available on Amazon from Erie River Publishing. It Calls from the Sea, narrated by yours truly and written by the wonderful authors over at Erie River, is available exclusively on Audible. It's 25 amazing horror stories all about the horrors of the deep, stories from the sea, and those horrors from the deep that find their way on land. It was a lot of fun being able to work on this book last year, and I'm really glad to be able to see it come out. If you guys are interested in picking it up, hearing some of these great stories, and helping to support some of those wonderful folks over at Erie River, check out the link in the description down below, or you can always just search for Mr. Creepypasta on Audible to find all the books that I've worked on. And now, on to tonight's story. I know this will probably sound like kind of odd, but believe me, I'm being dead serious over here. I strongly, and I mean strongly, advise that you never trade with a fae. You look confused. So let me say this as plainly as possible. If you stumble across a fairy ring somewhere, keep cruising along your way. Just don't pay it any mind. It's for the best, believe me. Just keep trucking. Don't look back because you might, you might offer to trade without even knowing it. That's a very bad situation. Let me explain. I was rambling around in the woods that surround my property a little while back, and I stumbled across a fairy ring. You know what I'm talking about? A fairy ring is a near-perfect circle of mushrooms. I'd seen them on a few different occasions in the past, but I didn't recognize this particular species of mushroom. It had a long, spindly stem. The cap was a weird, greenish tint that I'd never seen before. I thought it was odd enough to warrant a picture or two, so I wandered into the middle of the ring and I took a few pictures with my phone. I didn't think any more of it until I got back to my house and realized my pedometer was missing. I thought, crap, probably dropped it when I pulled out my phone. The sun was sinking low on the horizon and I was kind of pooched after the hike, so I made a mental note to go back and hunt for it the next day. I trekked back into the woods in the morning and I sifted through the carpet of dead leaves around the ferry ring, but the pedometer was nowhere to be found. I was searching, and a glittering hunk of rock caught my eye. I'd never seen anything like it before. It had a glassy, shiny surface. It was a very unusual shade of green. And I was a little bummed about losing my pedometer, but the shiny rock kind of made up for it. You know, it was, it was a really cool find. I wondered if it might actually have some value beyond being unusual. I made a trip into town for groceries later that day, and I stopped in at a local jeweler's shop to get his opinion. He turned it in his hands, then raised an eyebrow and said, Where'd you find this? A chunk of raw emerald. I felt my jaw hit the floor. The jeweler asked if I wanted to sell it. He offered me a good amount of money on the spot, no questions asked. I handed it over, I walked out of there with a decent lot of cash in my pocket. I headed back to the woods as soon as I got home. I brought a shovel along, it was time to investigate the area a little more thoroughly. I dug a series of holes inside and around the perimeter of the fairy ring, but all I found were earthworms and a flattened beer can. I put the shovel down and thought about it for a while. Where did the emerald come from? It didn't fall from the sky. I remember the pictures I had taken and pulled out my phone. I zoomed in on the interior of the fairy ring, but I couldn't see anything that resembled a big hunk of precious gemstones. It seemed that maybe the emerald actually did fall out of the sky. I murmured, or someone left it here after I was gone. I felt a funny little tingle down my spine. I was vaguely familiar with the legends that surrounded fairy rings. I mean, it's right there in the name, but I generally didn't lend much credence to that kind of thing. I thought about it some more, and I decided... It wouldn't hurt anything to leave the shovel inside of the fairy ring as an experiment. It seemed harmless enough, right? I'd come back the next day and see if anything happened. 
And if he was still there, then, well, it was a strange coincidence. If not, well, I, I'd cross that bridge when it came time. I returned to the fairy ring after work the next day, and the shovel was gone. In its place, I found two copper ingots, each of them about a half the size of a brick. I picked them up and stared at them in wonder. They looked sort of crude and unevenly cast. I doubted they'd been manufactured in a modern-day copper foundry. Both ingots had been stamped with a symbol of some kind, but they were too worn and tarnished to make any sense of. I was starting to feel a bit disturbed by the whole situation. If this was a prank of some kind, it was both very elaborate and very strange. I hightailed it home and locked my new treasure in my safe. I had no clue what to do with them. I could possibly take them to a scrapyard or something, but I wasn't sure if this was a good idea. This wasn't a pile of old pines and wiring from an old renovation. These things looked like something you'd see in a display of ancient artifacts at a museum. My little experiment had yielded some very strange results, and I, I honestly wasn't sure what to make of it. It appeared I'd accidentally started trading goods with some unseen entity. Be it human, or, well, you know, not human. Either way, it was probably a bad idea. If the culprit was a prankster, I didn't want to be a clown for their amusement. And as for the latter possibility, hell, I could rattle off a long list of reasons to avoid engaging with the supernatural. And number one on that list was I don't want to accidentally get myself killed. I decided the best course of action was to just stay away from the area for a while. The mushrooms would die off sooner or later, and the whole incident would eventually become a spooky but ultimately harmless story for a night around the campfire. I hope so, anyway. When I got up the next morning, I opened the curtains and discovered two tiny handprints on my bedroom window. This... This was pretty fucking creepy by itself. But here's the kicker. My bedroom is on the second floor. You can't reach that window unless you're standing on a ladder or teetering around on a pair of stilts. The handprints were dirty, smudgy little things about three inches long from the heel of the palm to the tips of the fingers. All of the fingers were the same length as the thumb, and there were only three fingers per hand. It, it was... really bizarre, and I didn't like it one bit. I wasn't quite at the point where I could wholly accept the existence of fairies, but... I'm also not a fucking idiot. Something strange was happening, an only half-rational explanation that was also pretty far-fetched. Who would go to that much trouble to pull a prank? I don't have many close friends, they're all normal people with busy lives. My closest neighbors are several humorless middle-aged farmers. None of those people would even imagine pulling some dumb shit like that for a laugh. They're the sort of people who think the height of hilarity is to wander up and ask, working hard or hardly working? You know? This this wasn't a prank. In fact, it was becoming more of a situation. I had an unwelcome vision of watching myself through its eyes, keeping very still amongst the withering undergrowth as the intruder stomped around the circle. I could see my pedometer come tumbling out of my pocket, shiny and exotic in the slanting autumn sun. After I had blundered away... They study the fallen treasure and declare a trade to the whispering winds? And maybe they did. And then I came back and stupidly offered a trade again, didn't I? My shovel, which they decided was worth exactly two copper ingots. But what are they exactly? A fairy? A whole group of fairies? What the heck do you call a group of fairies, anyway? Well, I had were questions without answers, but the most pressing question of all was why did they come to my house? My growing fear, absurd as it may have seemed, was that I pissed them off when I took the copper and didn't offer a new trade. I didn't know how this arrangement was supposed to work, but it's not like I had to sign a contract or anything. Maybe they were just curious? Hell, as far as I knew, the little bastards were planning to skip the whole trading thing and just rob my house. I checked out the rest of the house, room by room and discovered the same set of handprints on almost every window. Again, I had the uncomfortable notion the little fuckers had been casing my house. And in the end, my hunch proved to be sort of half right. A window in my kitchen was standing open. My toaster oven was missing. An iron dagger had been left in its place. The copper ingots, the blade looked like it had been roughly manufactured with a primitive forge. 
was 10 inches long, set into a wooden handle. Both sides of the blade were honed to a fine edge. Despite its apparent age, it was in almost perfect condition. I gave it an experimental stab in the air and thought, yeah, yeah, this thing's probably killed someone. There's no doubt the dagger was worth more than my shitty toaster oven, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was, I had somehow got locked into a trade agreement with supernatural forces beyond my understanding. If, if I didn't bring another item out to the fairy ring, they'd just come to my house and make the trade without me. It's probably lucky that they made off with my toaster oven and not my car. I sat down with my morning coffee. Thank fuck they didn't take the coffee maker. I mulled over my situation as I played around with the dagger. What was I supposed to do? Was I supposed to call the cops? I already knew that wouldn't fly. If this is a movie, I just Google how to get rid of fairies and I'd end up with joining forces with some kooky old guy that was an expert in folklore. The old guy would probably sacrifice his own life for no good reason during a climactic battle and the credits would roll after I tearfully reunited with my kitchen appliances. In reality, my choices were slim. I could continue to trade with them willingly or... They could just break into my house and take whatever the hell they wanted. I doubted I could stop them from getting in. They'd somehow unlock the window from the outside without breaking the glass. This was, um... This was a pretty impossible feat. I did it anyway. Maybe... Maybe I can reason with them. I said out loud. Then I laughed to myself. I mean, could they even understand English? Once again, if this was a Hollywood movie, the thieving little fucks would probably speak to me in a posh British accent, but... but... What if they didn't speak any human language at all? Past or present? To them, my words might sound like the teacher in the old Charlie Brown cartoon, you know, just a, just a muffled string of truncated syllables. Wah, 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 wah. It was even possible they were hardly able to perceive me at all. It would just be a vague... Fleeting shadow in their eyes. Who could say? My eccentric folklore expert wasn't real, so I was working in the dark over here. After a lengthy debate with myself and several more coffees, I grabbed the backpack and gathered up the money from the jeweler, the copper ingots, and the dagger. I hiked out to the fairy ring and plopped the backpack in the middle of the circle. Now that I was standing out in the fresh air and the sunshine, I was starting to feel pretty fucking stupid. I grimaced at my moronic predicament and called out, Uh, hey, can I get your attention for a minute? Um, listen, I never actually meant to trade anything with you folks. It was, it was all a misunderstanding. So here's all your stuff back, okay? I, I sold the emerald, but all the money is right there. I got you a good price. And you can, you can keep all my stuff. That's fine by me. So, so yeah. We, uh, you know, we square. Sorry about that. It, like a, it was a big mix up. Okay. Take care. I walked away with a deep sense of relief, mingled with some mild embarrassment. My brain understood that fairies and shit like that aren't real, but my heart said otherwise. I mean, either way, I felt I had done the right thing. I, I slept like a baby that night. Morning came, and I brought an unwelcome surprise along with it. I found the dagger, the copper, and the money laying in a row on my living room carpet. Much to my dismay, they had been joined by a fourth object. It looked a bit like a flute, and it was made out of clay. Once again, the doors and windows had been locked up tight, but they got inside anyway. I wandered around, looking to see if anything was missing, and then... I remembered the backpack. I thought, good work, idiot. You made another accidental trade. I was starting to get angry. Although I appreciated their honesty when doing commerce, I really didn't want these weird little fuckers breaking into my house at night. It was creepy as all kinds of levels, and it was, it was time for it to stop. After I got home from work, I marched out into the woods and stomped up the fairy ring. I dumped their unwanted goods into the circle and yelled, listen up. No more trading. Stay away from my house. Do you understand? I don't want to do this anymore, you little dickheads. I waited for a response, but of course, it was nothing but the wind in the treetops. I growled in frustration and flipped my invisible tormentors the bird. I demanded, well, do you get it? 
there was still no response. So, I decided to take their silence as a yes, and I went home. At this point, I was very fucking tired of trekking out to the woods to deal with my invisible nuisance. That's what I thought they were. A mild nuisance. Like a family of raccoons tearing up the garage at night. I had no idea how bad I'd just fucked up. But I found out very soon. I woke up in the small hours of the morning with a horrific flare of pain in my left hand. I sat up in the darkness and fumbled for the lamp, but something was wrong. My hand was wet. I, I couldn't get a good grip on the pull chain. There was a fluttering commotion in my bedroom window, and for a brief instance, I thought I saw a diminutive figure illuminated by the moonlight, just, just a flash of a tiny silhouette as the curtain was pulled aside. And it was gone. I grabbed the pull chain with my other hand, and I screamed when the light turned on. I was missing my middle finger on my left hand. I wrapped it tight with a t-shirt and frantically searched my bedroom, but my finger was gone. As I searched my room, I realized I could smell something foul at the foot of my bed. I, I found a pile of tiny and explosively stinky little turds on the blanket. The message was clear. The little bastards had removed the finger I'd used to flip them the bird, and they left behind an insult of their own. The fairy poop dissipated before my eyes, melting away and disappearing in a matter of seconds. If it weren't for the fact that I'd still had a bleeding stump of a finger on my left hand, I wouldn't have believed it. I told the nurse of the emergency room that I accidentally cut it off with a hatchet and lost it in the darkness. She asked why I was splitting firewood in the middle of the night, and I told her to mind her own business. I could see that she didn't believe me. The doctor, he told me the wound was far too clean to be the crushing wound from a hatchet. But I, I stubbornly stuck to my story, and in the end, I was obviously lucid, and I could answer all the questions so they didn't hold me for any mental health issues. Instead, they patched me up, they handed me a prescription for some antibiotics and painkillers, and they sent me on my way. I mean, what else was I going to do? Tell them the truth? That wouldn't have gone over very well at all. I stayed far away from that section of the woods in the winter. When spring came, the fairy ring was gone. My stump healed over by then. And although it still aches sometimes, I got used to working around my missing finger. Can't play the guitar anymore. And I wasn't very good at it anyway, so... Not really that much of a loss. Unfortunate. You know. They took my finger, not like my spleen or something. I haven't seen a fairy ring since, and I hope that it stays that way. If I ever see another one, I'm going to stay the hell away from it. So should you. It might seem like a really cool idea at first, but God, believe me, it's not. Little fuckers are serious about their business, and eventually you'll mess up somehow, and you'll wake up bleeding all over yourself. That is, if you even wake up at all. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you happen to be listening to this as a podcast or as a YouTube or however else you managed to have found this story for tonight. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who is supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months. And things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane. And I mean that with all sincerity. That you guys have helped me immensely. <laughs> so, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... 
Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster Pettis Weezer, Gaddis, Joseph Calarudo, Rudy B, Dante Kincaid, Town 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff Joe's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emma Clark, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Captain Scurvy, Escabeen, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinium, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Inchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sam, Chelly J, Bacamel, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, 80's Nephew, Peter Chip, Acid System, Mog, Kiri the Sloth, Buster's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night and sweet dreams.